Well, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, first of all, I'd like, to, I'd like to thank Joseph and IFOR and, and the wonderful staff of IFOR for uh, having me. It's uh, a real pleasure. Um, building bridges between disciplines, I think, is one of the most important tasks that we face uh, in, uh, in, in the modern, uh, not just the academic world, but in the world as well, because disciplines have things to teach each other that can uh, lead to praxis, to effects in the real world. Uh, but moreover, I think building bridges between nations, if there's something more important, would be, uh, would be the thing that, that's more important. And uh, it's a pleasure to speak here because I, of course, focused on both of these things, building bridges between disciplines and between nations. And uh, so uh, it's truly my pleasure to be able to share uh, a little bit about an extremely controversial topic with you. Um, but I do law and religion, so I, I never share anything that isn't extremely controversial. Um, I always tell my students, um, and uh, frequently in, in various books or whatever that I write, that you know, no matter what you believe, you're going to probably be aggravated by the end of uh, what I have to say. But, but I think that the interesting uh, aspect of it is um, that when we, when we look at these issues, not from uh, an inherently uh, invested perspective, when we're standing in some ways from outside of a debate, and able to look in with something of what we might call an academic eye, even if we accept that there's no Archimedean point from which we can say that something is, is inherently um, you know, uh, true or not true. There, there are certain facts that um, I think become quite helpful uh, to us in, in addressing the Asakuni issue. And those facts, interestingly enough, um, come uh, from the Japanese Supreme Court. Um, uh, a body that has actually spoken on uh, a, a, an unrelated issue with the Yasukuni Shrine. So let me um, begin, uh, first of all, by taking off my watch and putting it here to make sure that I stay within my time. Um, but then, um, let me point out um, a couple of things. First of all, that there are four elements to the Yasukuni Shrine issue. Uh, there's the element of constitutional law, which is obviously a major focus of my talk. The question of religion, uh, the nature of uh, traditional Shinto versus state Shinto, which I'll talk about, uh, and that is inherently connected to the first issue. I'm going to skip down to the fourth issue, which is the question of Japanese politics, the, uh, the sense of the people of Japan, which is also connected because of the way that the courts have evaluated religion issues to the first issue. And then we have the issue of geopolitics. Uh, many of you are familiar with the fact that uh, recently the Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, visited the Yasukuni Shrine. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the history of that shrine for those of you who are not familiar with it. This is uh, controversial uh, for a large number of reasons in the international community, particularly for China. Uh, and Korea, but also for countries in South Asia, um, and even um, to a, a more limited extent uh, in the United States, um, to the extent that anybody in the United States was actually paying attention. Um, I'm American, I can make fun of them. Uh, um, so the geopolitical issue is fascinating, and it's the geopolitical issue that has occupied most of the media and most of the attention on Yasakuni. And yet, I'm going to talk more about these three issues and their connection and suggest that it's actually the combination of this approach, constitutional law, looking at religion and Japanese politics, that may in the end provide a way to address the geopolitical issues. Um, so I'm sort of coming at it from the perspective of uh, this being the most controversial uh, for a number of good reasons, but perhaps from other disciplines looking at law, um, religion, and politics, perhaps we might find a solution uh, from within Japan to the geopolitical uh, issue. Okay, so with that said, I'm now going to give you, um, well, actually, I'm going to go back to slide. Uh, I'm now going to give you a real quick uh, Cliff's Notes on uh, State Shinto and Shinto. Um, I, for those of you not familiar with the idea of cliff notes, maybe the idea of a tapas would make sense. I'm going to give you some really small tastes uh, on this issue, on these really controversial questions.
questions, um, but I want to say that you could spend an entire conference talking about just uh, traditional Shinto or the history of state Shinto. And so I'm going to give you just the most basic overview. Uh, what you need to know is there's a significant difference between traditional Shinto, which goes back thousands of years in Japan, um, involves concepts um, that are fascinating and um, include elements of animism and uh, other things, but I'm going to particularly focus on the traditional Shinto concept of a kami, or what you might call an eternal spirit. Western language doesn't have great, you know, because we tend to talk in terms of a god or a spirit. The, the kami are sort of a, a mixture of these things, and they're, they're um, the, the sort of the spirits of the dead, and, and it's very relevant in Shintoism, um, the concept of a kami, and a kami can be enshrined uh, in, a, in a shrine. Generally, this is completely uncontroversial. Um, this has been going on for thousands of years. Um, historically, Shintoism, traditional Shintoism, coexisted, predated Buddhism in, in uh, Japan, and it coexisted quite well with Buddhism up until the Meiji era of state Shinto. Um, state Shinto took one element of traditional Shinto, which was uh, a, a recognition of imperial ancestry the ancestry of the emperor uh, in, in Shinto lore back to the goddess Amaratsu, the sun goddess, um, and uh, the idea of, of this unbroken lineage uh, in the imperial household. For most traditional, traditional Shinto practitioners, this wasn't the major focus of their Shintoism. Their own family um, uh, spirits, the, um, their own um, future and luck and, and hopes and dreams, those were the focus of traditional Shinto. There was some recognition of imperial uh, ancestry, but it wasn't a major, major focus of traditional Shinto. State Shinto was the imposition by government of imperial-focused Shinto. Um, and there's a great book written in uh, 1912, actually, by uh, a Japanese legal scholar called Ancestor Worship and Japanese Law. Um, and it, it really, it was written after state Shinto had been around for about 40 years. And uh, reading that book and comparing it to books on traditional Shinto from the Edo era, just before the Meishi era, it's remarkable how different um, traditional Shinto and state Shinto, even in, in close proximity, in time, uh, they, how, how different they were. State Shinto was a top-down affair. The government controlled it for the most part. Uh, it was connected to very strong elements of nationalism. Um, the first uh, principle of the Meishi Constitution was that the emperor was holy and inviolate. That was relevant to concepts of state Shinto. Um, also, state Shinto um, required monitoring of Buddhism. So uh, a, a government Shinto shrine was uh, put into every Buddhist temple. Many local Shinto leaders were aghast at this because they had had such good relationships um, with the local Buddhist temples. And there had always been shrine temple connections, but not government imposed. Um, and so um, this was very controversial. And it did, through a, a long twist of events, lead to a support for militarism and imperialism uh, and a sense of national superiority that was borrowed heavily actually from Europe, but was engrafted onto state Shinto. And this led to um, the controversies we talk about today when we look at the Yasukuni Shrine. The Yasukuni Shrine is one of the few remnants left of state Shinto. Um, and you, know, you need to understand that the Yasukuni Shrine itself was found that it was not called the Yasukuni Shrine until 1879, but it was founded in 1868. Um, and it was not founded as a purely state Shinto shrine. It was founded as something more like what we might consider in America the Arlington National Cemetery or something along those lines. It was a place for um, the war dead from the Boshin War, 
which was a war uh, for uh, what uh, you know, Emperor Meishi and, and others uh, suggested was a war for freedom from the Shogun. So the uh, the Meiji Restoration occurred after the Shogun uh, the Shoguns were essentially ousted from power. The Boshi War was a war in which a lot of that happened. And the first individuals, the first kami enshrined at Yasukuni, even before it was called Yasukuni, in 1868, were the war dead from the Boshi War. And that enshrinement continued uh, through the latter part of the 19th century. <laughs> but Yasukuni became particularly controversial actually after World War II. During the state Shinto era, during the Meishi era, the state directly supported Yasukuni. Uh, there was state money, there was state support, Yasukuni was a state shrine, uh, and, uh, and it was, um, you know, very heavily glorified under the state Shinto era. However, after World War II, the occupation government um, had sort of two goals. Uh, well, it had a number of goals, but uh, one, one of the goals, this is, this is a problem with any occupation government, right? Uh, they, the occupation government thinks it knows what's best for the local people, and rarely it doesn't even understand the local people. Um, in this case, though, the, the occupation government's goals were to get rid of state Shinto, uh, which actually just probably through sheer coincidence would have been more consistent with the long history of traditional Shinto. State Shinto was something of an aberration uh, of, of traditional Shinto, even traditional emperor Shinto. Um, and to get rid of imperial power. Um, and the two were seen as somewhat connected. So the Japanese constitution of 1946 actually had religion clauses. And these are the religion clauses. They're still in the constitution today. Uh, Article 20, uh, freedom of religion is guaranteed to all. That's what we call a, a free exercise notion, the idea that everybody has the freedom uh, to practice the religion, regardless of what religion that is. No religious organization shall receive any privileges from the state, nor exercise any political authority. Um, that is sort of the death knell for state Shinto, um, but has relevance to modern circumstances as well. No person shall be compelled to take part in any religious act, celebration, rite, or practice. This is really important because in state Shinto, people were compelled. Um, there's this um, rumor out there, mostly actually among American scholars of Japanese law, and it's, it's actually not accurate, um, that uh, the Meishi era was an era of great free exercise of religion. Um, it was an era where there was a language in the Constitution that talked about free exercise, uh, but there was no free exercise. If you didn't take part in these celebrations, you were, you were uh, essentially a problem. Uh, under the Meishi government, and, uh, and you know, Buddhists and, and many others were in prison. Uh, the state and its organs shall refrain from religious education or any other religious activity. That was also an element of state Shinto. Um, the government under state Shinto enforced um, religious teachings about state Shinto in the schools. People were inculcated into state Shinto. Um, Article 89, no public money or other property shall be expended or appropriated for the use, benefit, or maintenance of any religious institution or association, or for any charitable, educational, or benevolent enterprise is not under the control of public authority. This is a funding clause, no funding. Ooh, I dropped my microphone. One second. The, um, this is a, a no funding provision. Uh, but the, all of this combined is an attempt to essentially kill state Shinto um, as, as a government-supported entity. So Yasukuni did the legal thing. It went private. There's, and I want to be clear, no one, I, I, at least I'm not questioning the right of Yasukuni to exist and the right of private individuals to go there, uh, particularly if their relatives are enshrined. Um, you know, we're, what we're talking about here and I wrote it in Japanese, Seiji Toshokyo no Buri, or separation of government and religion under the Japanese constitution. So it's Seiji Toshokyo no Buri means the separation of government and religion. 
It's not exactly the same thing as uh, separation of church and state, um, but there was the established state Shinto. Um, and, and, and one of the ideas of Seijin Kyo Shokyo no Bunri is to get rid of uh, government uh, support for religion. Uh, but this was imposed from the outside. These are essentially American ideas uh, imposed on Japan. Uh, from, from the outside, and, and, and Japanese existence is not based on the dualisms of the West. In the West, there's these notions that you're, you know, somehow, you know, you're, you're religious or you're not religious, or you're, you've got, you know, this is your religion and this is your culture. But in Japan, the concept of bunga, or culture, and shukyo, um, religion, are there's a connection for many people. Boom! They, they may not even believe in the shukyo, but out of culture, there is a sense of respect. Um, and the other way around as well. There are people who may have uh, very deep religious beliefs from whatever religion they are, but for cultural reasons, will respect or pay pay respect to other institutions. So these Western ideas had to be interpreted by the Japanese courts so that they could fit Japan. And the courts did this in a line of cases. And I want to focus um, particularly on a case that is one of the most remarkable and well-written opinions, I think, in the history of the Japanese Supreme Court. Um, the, the, for those of you who want to read it, it is an English translation. It's, it, I will say it's better in the original Japanese, um, but, um, but it, it, it's just more detailed um, in, in the regular Japanese, and the court uses some um, um, very strong language condemning state Shinto, um, but, but not condemning traditional Shinto. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. The case um, itself revolved around what's called Tamagushi. And this is an artist's rendering of Tamagushi. Tamagushi is an offering uh, at a Shinto shrine. You take a uh, twig from a Sakiko tree, and there's uh, paper that are uh, tied to that, papers that are tied to that, and the offering is given uh, at a shrine. And this is not limited to Yasukuni. The, the, the Tamagushi occurs at many, many Shinto shrines. It's a normal offering to the, to the shrine. It has uh, a meanings for luck, for future, for respect. Tamagushi is a, it's, there have been entire books written about Tamagushi. It's, it's a very rich cultural practice. You can still see it today um, if, you, if you go to Shinto shrines, um, particularly at ceremonial times, but, but even at other times. Um, the heavy Tamagushi case was interesting because it involved Tamagushi at the Yasukuni shrine. And not just Tamagushi at the Yasukuni Shrine, but Tamagushi at the Yasukuni Shrine, sponsored and paid for by Shadaishi, who was the governor of Ehemi Prefecture, which is in, uh, far to the south of Tokyo. The Yasukuni Shrine is in, is in Tokyo. So uh, Shadaishi ordered some of his uh, underlings to go and offer Tamagushi at the Yasukuni and the Gakoko Shrine, which is a similar uh, entity, it's the other one that has a, some connection to state Shinto, at the Yasukuni Shrine. Now understand, at this point, Yasukuni is private. It gets no money from the government. Yasukuni is not a, there, there is no question in this case about government directly supporting Yasukuni, because the government can't do that. So the, the question in this case was, does the governor of a prefecture using state funds to send representatives to Yasukuni to offer Tamagushi pay for the state funds, does this violate the concept of Seiji Tosha Kyo no Bundi, or as I said, separation of government and religion under Articles 20 and 89 of the Japanese Constitution? And what's fascinating about this is the court looked at an earlier case called the Tsu City case, 
which applied a test um, very similar to a test that we apply in the U.S. where it looked at what was the purpose, what was the reason for a government action, and what was the effect of that action on people generally. Now, in the Sioux City case, it involved traditional Shinto, a groundbreaking ceremony for a jinn. And the court held that there was a non-religious purpose, and that purpose was bunka, Japanese culture, that we have to look at purpose and effect, and I'll, and I'll actually quote the opinion here, uh, it's only a problem if the purpose and effect of what the government's doing goes beyond the appropriate limits in light of social and cultural circumstances in Japan. And the court in Sioux City said, oh, but this is just a local Shinto groundbreaking ceremony. People have been doing this for years. It's, it's got religious elements, but it's really bunka. It's just culture, bunka's culture. So it's just accepted as part of Japanese culture. It's not controversial. It's not out of the boundaries. Um, many lawyers in Japan, uh, as well as, by the way, religious scholars, questioned the result of the decision because they felt that this concept of Shinto as bunka was actually uh, a formalistic way for the court to avoid the fact that the state was supporting an actual religious ritual here. And the, many of the people who were most upset about it were devout Shintos, uh, people who were devout Shinto practitioners because in a sense it belittled traditional Shinto. This ceremony was not just bunka to these individuals. This ceremony actually had religious meaning. That case, I'm just giving you the background on that case. We're not going to question that case here. And Hemi Tamaguchi is amazing because it, it was decided in 1997. Uh, some of you looking for it in English, you might see it as a case called Anzai v. Shiraishi because a lot of Western legal scholars th thought that you're supposed to use the Western idea of who was the plaintiff and who was the defendant in writing the name of the case, but that's not the way the Japanese courts write the case. So you'll see it written both ways. For those interested, I can give you the, the citations. Uh, but the Japanese Supreme Court, for the first time in a case involving establishment of religion or government support of religion, talked about the history of Articles 20 and 89 from their imposition by the American government to their acceptance and, in fact, consistency through interpretation with the Japanese being. It is a brilliantly written decision, fascinating decision, because the court says state Shinto was the reason for Articles 20 and 89. And the court recognized Articles 20 and 89 were imposed on the Japanese people by America. The court said, but state Shinto was imposed on the Japanese people by the Meiji, Taisho, Ta uh, Taisho and early Sho, and particularly the military that was really using state Shinto for its benefit was, you know, uh, those of you who are familiar with Japanese history understand that Taisho was, was not all there, and that's what the military particularly manipulated. Uh, the concept. Uh, and the court goes through the history of the connection between state Shinto and militarism and how that's inconsistent with the modern pacifist culture in Japan. The, 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 um, the court goes through um, the discussion of how the Articles 20 and 89 were imposed on Japan from outside and how the language is not by itself completely consistent with Japanese being or Dasan, but how the Japanese people have come to embrace the concept. And I will say this as a law and religion scholar. Japan is quite possibly the single best country in the world for religious freedom. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of other issues for, for foreigners and, and other issues in terms of um, uh, discrimination and issues like that. But on religious freedom, Japan is amazing. There, there just are virtually no issues um, uh, in Japan, uh, other than the Yasukuni issue, uh, uh, where religious freedom questions 
um, really divide the Japanese people. The Japanese people have a sort of live and let live mentality on religion, um, not a Western sort of dualistic mentality. Um, and um, this is reflected in the Hemi Tamagoshi. The court says, we've made these provisions, Article 20 and 89, our own. They have become Japanese, uh, even if they were imposed by America. And a quite just a brilliant decision. The court looks at the purpose of the giving of Tamagoshi and says, this is clearly unconstitutional. Um, Yasukuni is not accepted, um, and it is not something that is within the appropriate limits in light of social and cultural circumstances in Japan. The Yasukuni Shrine is controversial within Japan. Um, it was even before uh, Class A war criminals were enshrined there. Um, and uh, the court, again, it's, it's a very well written opinion, points out Class A war criminals, it's, it's, it's a letter. You know, it, it, it sounds horrible, oh, there's Class A war criminals. But there were Class B and C war criminals there before that. Um, and B and C war criminals are people who are more involved in the trenches and killing people. Um, and so the, the court points out that the Yasukuni issue had always been controversial from the post-war era. And, um, and so the court says the purpose of giving Tamaguchi uh, is either a, a religious purpose, which is to recognize the kami of the war dead, uh, in which case it's a laudable purpose for private individuals, but not for government. Or its purpose was to pander, to use religion to pander to nationalists and any prefect. Which, in that case, you're using a religious means to achieve the secular political end, and that's unconstitutional also. The court looked at the effects of giving Tamaguchi, and in there it looked at the perception of the average Japanese citizen, and said the average Japanese citizen who's aware of the Yasukuni shrine history and controversy um, would perceive this as a religious act. And again, the problem isn't that somebody's going to give Tamagushi a Yasukuni shrine. Anybody has the freedom to do that. People have the freedom to love or hate the Yasukuni shrine under the Japanese Constitution. We only care in the constitutional context about what the government does. Okay? It's not a question of whether a private individual can or cannot go to the Yasukuni shrine. You, you or I may have concerns with uh, revisionism or whatever that may be there, but, but people have a right uh, to, to, to go there and do what they want. The question is whether government can pay for that, whether government should pay for that. The court looked at six factors uh, that relate to purpose and effects, but most of them relate to the things that I, I mentioned. So they looked at the external aspects of the con co conduct. How would somebody perceive it? Uh, the place of the conduct, it's the Asakuni Shara. The average person's religious understanding, they understand a shrine is where kami are enshrined, therefore it's religious. The actor's religious intent, the court was really interesting there, they pointed out that Shiraishi either had a religious intent or a nationalist pandering intent for which he used religion, in either way that's unconstitutional. Um, and the influence of the average person, um, the court said pretty much that works against um, giving Tamaguchi with state money. Uh, and then objective judgment based on socially accepted ideas. What's socially accepted in Japan? And this is where this case is the most amazing. The court pointed out this isn't Sioux City. This isn't traditional Shinto. Traditional Shinto is accepted by most Japanese as just sort of part of culture and life, whether they believe in it or not. It's just, it's just part of you know, you do a groundbreaking, you have a Shinto dedication. Why? You want the workers to be safe. You want there to be good fortune for the, for the building. But Yasukuni, the court said, is different. Yasukuni is not part of the social consciousness of every Japanese. It, it is not part of um, the long-standing bunka uh, in Japan. It's an edifice of a temporary era and one that is controversial to many Japanese. Uh, and so the court's looking within Japan. It's not looking at the geopolitical. Because it can't. The Japanese Constitution says you need to look with, within Japan, as does the US Constitution. Within the US, you can look at other countries' law, 
but not the geopolitics. So now we've got um, government visits to the Yasukuni Shrine, visits by the Prime Minister, that's Shinzo Abe visiting the Yasukuni Shrine or something. But notice the microphones in his face. Um, and the, what you have is the public-private distinction is what they've argued after Ehemi Tamaguchi. They've argued we don't have to play the game. What they've argued is that the test applies uh, to us. Uh, uh, the test does not apply to us, I'm sorry. The purpose and effects test does not apply to us because we're going as individuals. I'm not going as the Prime Minister of Japan. I'm going as Shinzo Abe, private individual. In fact, I'll even sign the guest book that way. Never mind that national and international media are focused on it. Never mind that I call their attention to it. Never mind that I'm using it in rallying speeches to nationalist groups. Never mind that my own Office of Public Affairs, as well as the shrines, have called attention to the fact that I'm going to engage in this visit. Um, and so the argument is that there is this public-private distinction. Um, and my argument is, in, in an article that, that, that's about to come out, is this argument makes no legal or practical sense. Um, but a number of lower Japanese courts accepted this public-private distinction, even after the Hemi Tamaguchi. That distinction goes against the spirit of the Hemi Tamaguchi. Uh, that case, but you have to understand, in Japan, precedent is, doesn't have the same effect that it does in, say, the United States, where it's binding on lower courts. Um, it, lower courts have a little more leeway. But the Osaka High Court, or what you might call the Ichiban Cool Court, the, the coolest court in Japan, um, it is, I, I'm from Philadelphia, and I always like to say that Philadelphia is the Osaka of America. Um, because the Osaka High Court is a place where very progressive judges seem to seek refuge. And by progressive, I don't mean politically progressive. I mean legally thoughtful and progressive, not overly formalistic. Judges who will look at precedent and read the, the, the whole precedent to understand what it actually means. Um, and take some serious time to make a decision. And in applied Article 20 of the Japanese Constitution, when the former Prime Minister Kozumi visited Yasukuni and held that the visit was unconstitutional for all the reasons that the Tamaguchi offerings were unconstitutional in a Hemi Tamaguchi. And the court rejected the public-private distinction because these visits are clearly not private. And since the test that the Japanese Supreme Court has created is heavily based on the perception of the average citizen in Japan, the average person, the average person is aware these visits are not purely private because they're seeing it on the news. They may not understand the international controversy that it sparks. They may not understand why that controversy exists. There is um, one of the issues around Yasukuni is its connection to historical revisionism. There's a museum there that that that. Prime Ministers don't visit. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, I thought I heard somebody say that. But, um, but, it's, but Prime Ministers don't visit um, uh, that because that would be way too controversial. But there is sort of that revisionism in the Japanese school curriculum, and a lot of Japanese citizens aren't really aware of why, uh, until they get to college sometimes, why um, the, the Yasukuni Shrine is so um, uh, uh, controversial in geopolitical sense. But the Osaka High Court's decision is brilliant. Unfortunately, it's also not translated into English. I wish it, maybe, maybe at some point, if I can prove my kanji well enough. I had my research assistant write kana above it, so I can read it. Uh, that's for them. Uh, but the, um, the, the court points out that it doesn't matter whether it's controversial internationally, although that's, it, it, the court points out it should be controversial inter internationally. Uh, because of, uh, of Japan's actions, which is what the Supreme Court had said in the Hemi Tamaguchi. There's a reason for the international uh, outrage. But the, but the court said even within Japan it's controversial because Japan is a pacifist culture and those who are aware of Yasukuni's history tend to fall into two categories. 
nationalists who support visits there, but a very large group of Japanese citizens who uh, are part of the pacifist culture in Japan and oppose visits to Yasukuni. And even though those groups combined are not even a majority of the citizenry, it shows a huge dispute among Japanese citizens. And the Osaka High Court said, well, that shows it's not commonly accepted. Uh, it's just a really interesting decision. So, inspired by, I think, the brilliant concept of IFO, uh, the idea of building bridges across disciplines and across nations, I wonder, what, in what way could constitutional law be a tool for conflict resolution? And I'm going to be a complete hypocrite here and say I very rarely believe that constitutional decisions can actually be a tool for conflict resolution um, if, the, if, if at the more local, smaller level, people aren't ready for change. However, I do believe in this case, constitutional law could conceivably be a tool. If this case goes up to the Nihon no Saito Saibama, the Japanese Supreme Court, um, and you get a case like a Hemi Tamaguchi that actually was educational, the Asai Shinbun and other newspapers talked about the court's reasoning in, uh, in that case. And uh, it could be a way uh, to resolve a lot of these controversies. Uh, in, uh, not resolve, but to educate the Japanese people on, well, why is this unconstitutional? To talk about that, you have to talk about the history of State Shinto, Article 20, Article 89, Dasakuni. It could be very educational. Uh, but the court could only do that if it found the practice to be unconstitutional. Uh, the, the practice of high level officials visiting it. We don't know what the court would do. Um, if it follows a Hemi Tamaguchi, it clearly would find it unconstitutional. But it doesn't have to follow a Hemi Tamaguchi. A well written decision could be a teaching moment for the nation and its people, but I also believe it could send a message to neighboring countries about what the core values of Japan really are. You know, I, in neighboring countries, I talk to colleagues from China and other countries who, who um, you know, uh, don't always understand it. Most Japanese people, they didn't vote for Abe because he's going to visit the Asakuni shrine. It was, all, it was about economics. Most Japanese people don't agree with um, the radical statements of, of someone like Shinzo Abe. That's going to appeal to a very small group of nationalists that vote in very high numbers. Um, but I think most people don't understand, sort of, in a way, maybe the soul of Japan, the the nature of um, uh, many of the Japanese people, uh, and the fact that, for example, it's almost no attention is paid to the fact that neither Emperor Hirohito nor Emperor Akihito have visited the shrine since the Class A war criminals were enshrined there. And Hirohito's papers are now being published. Um, and there's some writings in those papers from his, um, from, from the, the, the head of the imperial household uh, that, that talk about his reasons for not visiting. And he was troubled visiting even before the Class A war criminals were enshrined there. Um, but no emperor has visited since the Class A war criminals were enshrined there. That's a very powerful message, considering that Yasukuni was created by the imperial household. Um, and many Japanese would never visit Yasukuni, you know, even if they were in Tokyo. Um, it, it's, you know, Japan is a culture that is heavily based, in a way, on conflict resolution, on a need to get along, many people on a small island, a need to maintain social cohesion, uh, and minimize conflict to the greatest extent possible. And so when somebody like Shinzo Abe does something that's so controversial internationally, domestically the reporting on it may be designed to minimize controversy. Um, and so I think that a written decision by the Japanese Supreme Court that was then published internationally would show here is one of the three branches of Japanese government that is saying, these visits are wrong. People overseas are not listening when people, even within the LDB party, say these visits are wrong. Um, or when Japanese scholars say these visits are wrong. There are many Japanese who have spoken. But the international community doesn't seem to hear those voices. And I think if the Japanese Supreme Court spoke, 
That would be a voice that the international community would hear. And maybe through, if the opinion was written in a way like Ebony Tamaguchi, would be able to see some of the beautiful soul of the Japanese people that stands in direct contrast to the horror elements of uh, someone like Shinzo Abe's visit to the Asakun shrines, and perhaps the nationalist candor that that involves. Uh, that may overshadow the beauty of the Japanese people. And I hope that maybe bridges can be built by judges of all people uh, so that perhaps the geopolitical issues could be resolved by a decision that looks solely at what's going on in Japan to define the separation of religion and government. Again, I, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time to listen to me. Um, I drone on about uh, law and religion, and I want to thank I for for an opportunity to uh, share some interdisciplinary ideas, but also some um, international ideas, maybe give you a different perspective on um, on a very important issue. So I hope you learned a little something.